one point I want to make before I start with my actual talk is how important all this is. I just talked to a group of high school students and freshmen at Columbia University last week who are incoming science students, and the point we all wanted to stress to them is um, that it's tough to be a scientist nowadays and it's tough to be a professional related to science because we all know science is at risk, it's actively being attacked, and there's, it's much more trendy to, to make up your information. And scientist is an important, science is an important tool for discerning the truth, and we just need to keep improving our skills at doing that. So anyway, thank you very much. I'm going to talk today about our work at Palmer Station on the Antarctic Peninsula in Antarctica. It's another LTER site. It was started in 1990, so um, we're coming up on 30 years of observations now, and I'll show you some of those in a few minutes. Um, at Columbia, I work in a group called Biology and Paleo Environment, and there's scientists there who have time series that are 100 million years long or a billion years long, and we're really excited about our 30 years. It's been a, a lot of work, and now that it's 30 years long, we can really begin to see some things happening. But it's important to keep the perspective that our 30 years of work is layered on top of lots of changes that have been going back very far in time. So this is a picture of sea ice. Sea ice happens when the atmospheric, the air temperature uh, falls below the freezing point of seawater, which is about minus two degrees Celsius. And so the surface of the ocean freezes. And um, this is the fundamental point significant process of the entire marine ecosystem in Antarctica. All the marine organisms have their life cycles and their key life processes and their survival keyed to the extent and the duration and the advance and the retreat of sea ice. And one of our big messages is that this area is warming and one of the main things that's happening with the warming is that sea ice is going away. And so Organisms, including penguins and seals and whales, are just literally seeing their environment melt away from beneath them. And I'm going to talk just about a couple aspects of that. So, as I said, we started, uh, the program started in 1990. We started serious observations in 1992. Um, this is the Antarctic Peninsula. It's the part of Antarctica that sticks up towards South America. And it's one of the most rapidly warming environments on the whole planet. And I'll be showing you something about that. And so it is anomalous for the rest of continental Antarctica is that it's at lower latitude. It's a little warmer because of that. But that isn't the whole story about why it's warming up. And so the government operates this uh, research station, Palmer Station, right there, which is right at the epicenter of the warming. Um, it's entirely fortuitous that there's a research base there in what turned out to be a place where it's warming. And so um, that's wonderful. And it also gives us a great obligation to do this work and get it right. Um, the ecosystem is responding to all aspects of the warming at all trophic levels, from bacteria and phytoplankton on up to penguins, seals, and whales. Um, and I want to make a couple simple points about how we know those things by a series of time series observations over the past few decades. Um, and there are some key points about time series that I want you to become familiar with. As Anne already showed, there's lots of year-to-year -year variability, and it makes distinguishing the trends really difficult. Um, even when we have lots of complicated statistical tools, it's pretty hard to pull those trends out of the noise in the background. Um, a lot of what I just, this second called noise, of course, isn't noise at all. It's real events that make the air temperature warmer and colder from year to year, that make the sea ice duration less or more. And we need to understand the drivers of all those events as well as the long-term trends. And that all begs the question of when do we call a trend a trend? And I'm going to show you a good example of that. That's Palmer Station. It's one of three bases operated by the government. Uh, Palmer Station is uh, small. It only has 45 people, about half scientists and half support people. And it's accessed by sailing a boat across the Drake Passage to Palmer Station. Uh, 
door to door, it takes about a week to get to Palmer Station. By the time you get to Punta Arenas, South America, get on the boat, cross, and then get off the boat again. So you can't fly there. It's a remarkably inaccessible place. But because of the warming, it is accessible all winter. So that's nice. So here's a time series um, that is from Faraday Station. Uh, it's a formerly British, now Ukrainian station that's about um, 20 miles from Palmer Station. And I pick it because it has this long, incredible temperature record going back to 1947. And you can see that there's, there's warm years and cold years. Uh, this time series is actually the average winter temperature at Faraday. So you take all the temperature measurements for June, July, and August, the austral winter, and plot those. And what we see is that the winter temperature in this region is increasing really rapidly. Um, it's been decreasing at 0.086 degrees per year, which doesn't seem like very much. But over 70 years, it's an 11 degree Fahrenheit change in the winter temperature. Think about 11 degrees. If we had changed here the winter temperature 11 degrees over that period of time, you would see the difference. And we're seeing it there as well. But so we do have years with warm winters and cold winters, and yet there is this significant uh, trend in there. And there's also some significant periods of um, warm winters and other periods of cold winters. And it turns out that that's driven partly by the El Nino, La Nina uh, climate signal. So we have global signals that impact Antarctica. Here's a sea ice record. You can measure sea ice from satellite. The satellite first went up in 1978. And again, you can see that the sea ice is declining. And we see that there's years where the sea ice lasts for a large portion of the year and other years when it lasts for a smaller portion of the year. But overall, it's going down. And you're probably already thinking, why did this record stop so abruptly in 2008? And actually, it didn't. The record is continuing today. But uh, if we'd stopped right there in 2008, we would have concluded that the duration of sea ice has declined by 140 days per year over that period, which is also pretty striking, 140 days less of sea level uh, or sea, sea ice uh, coverage each year. But of course, the record goes on. And it, what's really um, what's of great interest to us right now is this period starting in 2008 when the sea ice duration has been getting larger again. And it's not obviously due to the air temperature. Um, in fact, it's due to climate modes like the ENSO, El Nino, La Nina mode that change from northerly to southerly winds, which are either warm or cold winds. They help to spread the sea ice or they compact the sea ice. And those trends, El Nino trend and another one called the subantarctic oscillation, um, they're being affected by climate change. So the big climate modes on the planet are being affected by climate change <coughs> where the high and low pressure areas are. And that, in turn, is affecting sea ice, and that in turn is affecting the ecosystem. So the ecosystem I have to show penguins. And this is <laughs> primarily a record of, in red, the Adelie penguin breeding uh, pairs of penguins. So started uh, in 1975 by a um, grad student who's been coming back to Palmer Station nearly every year since. And back in 1975, there were 15,000 breeding pairs so 30,000 individual breeding penguins uh, at Palmer Station. And you can see the gradual and then sharp decline down to about 2,500 pairs today. So in that period of time from 1975, the native Adelie penguins have declined by 90%. That's mostly due to the loss of sea ice and other climate-related factors. At the same time, we have Gen 2 penguins, and chinstrap penguins that are penguins that are adapted to a warmer climate from a lower latitude further north from the Antarctic Peninsula. They live in the subantarctic islands. And as the environment gets more favorable, they are flooding in to this area. So we still have penguins. Um, right now, there's about an equal number of gentoos and adelies. And we have no idea what the uh, implications of that change might be. Um, one implication of it is, is that it immediately attracts people's attention 
and curiosity because everybody seems to find penguins lovable and nice and it's certainly of concern that they're being affected by this and it's a great tool for us to use to talk about climate change in Antarctica. So um, I think I'm going to let that one go. I did make the point that uh, these uh, climate modes affect the duration of sea ice, uh, either low or high ice, and that changes the, uh, the breeding success of krill, which are eaten by penguins, seals, and whales. And all of those changes are being affected by anthropogenic warming. So um, thanks very much.